A few weeks back, I asked the great gaming community to vote for their favorite DLC from Fallout 4. It came as no surprise that Far Harbor won out. However, what was surprising was that after more than 8,000 votes, Far Harbor accounted for more than three quarters of the overall vote. That's not exactly a close call, especially when you consider that there are six separate DLCs released for Fallout 4. Now, I personally tend to agree that Far Harbor is the best DLC in Fallout 4, and I would rank it toward the top of any DLC offered in any Fallout game, but I was a bit curious if this all just came down to my personal interests and playstyles, or whether there actually are objectable and definable qualities that make it far and away the best part of Fallout 4's downloadable content. So today I'm back at it, trying to set my personal biases aside, and probably failing, to see whether Far Harbor is really so deserving of so much praise, or whether the low expectations of Fallout 4 simply make Far Harbor look good by comparison. Just like with our Nuka World video, we'll be using the Grays Is It Good score to rate this DLC. We'll look at 4K categories, storyline, explorable area, new object usefulness, and expansion to gameplay mechanics. I'll rank each of these on a scale of 1 to 5 for a total possible score of 20. So hollow out your Meyer Alert carapace and brew up some Vim Captain's Blint because I'm Grey, you're watching Grey Gaming, and today we're putting Far Harbor to the test. I'm just gonna warn you now, this discussion of an 8-year-old DLC to a 9-year-old video game is going to have spoilers. Please learn to deal. Now, getting this show on the road, the DLC starts off with you getting a message from Ellie, Nick Valentine's assistant, that the Valentine Detective Agency has a new client. So we head over to Diamond City and get the skinny. You see, years back, Nick worked with a guy named Kenji Nakano, and now Kenji needs his help. Now you're free to scoop up Nick and head over to the Nakano residence together, or you can go by yourself, but trust me, the story is way better if you bring Nick along. Regardless, you head over to the Nakano residence where Kenji and his wife Rei are distraught. Their daughter Kasumi has gone missing and they're desperate to find out where she is and what happened to her. But it quickly becomes apparent that this isn't going to be a straightforward disappearance case, as the spouses disagree on the circumstances surrounding Kasumi's disappearance. Rei believes that Kenji's overprotectiveness has finally driven Kasumi, age 19, to run away and start a life of her own. While Kenji believes that Kasumi would have never just run away in the middle of the night without an explanation, especially since she took one of the family's two working boats, possibly the only two working boats in the entire commonwealth, a treasure to be sure. As you investigate the house and its surroundings looking for clues, you come to find a number of holotapes Kasumi recorded documenting the various projects that she's been working on. It seems that her grandfather had taught her how to tinker with things and she's largely responsible for half of the working appliances and electronics found throughout the Nakano household. But as more and more holotapes are found, including one left on her grandfather's gravesite, a picture begins to emerge that Kasumi is not just growing frustrated that Kenji refuses to let her leave the safety of her childhood home, but she's also beginning to suffer recurring nightmares and is even struggling to remember things from her childhood. A breakthrough in the case comes when Kasumi records that she was able to get a ham radio working and managed to make contact with a settlement named Acadia near a place called Far Harbor. This settlement is populated with people called synths, artificial beings, and what's more, the dreams and memory lapses that she's having lead the synths to suspect that she's actually one of them. She took the boat to head north to Far Harbor, attempting to reach the refuge of Acadia in search of answers. When pressed for more information, the Nakanos are adamant that Kasumi is not a synth. They conceived, birthed, raised, and loved her all in the safety of their isolated little home. There is no chance in their eyes that she's been replaced. So Kenji gives you access to the remaining family boat. This one even has an automated guidance system, so you don't even have to do any piloting. Just weigh anchor and set sail. Already this is a pretty strong opening. Mystery, uncertainty, no, I work for a bunch of raiders who intend to kill you, here please step into this trap. The setting and premise is fairly unique compared to what we've seen in Fallout 4 to date, but still feels rooted in this universe. It's enough to get players intrigued without giving away the plot too early. Honestly, I don't even think I could come up with a better solution if I tried. We arrive at Far Harbor, a small fishing village on the coast of an isolated island, and dock at a pier to find two people arguing. One appears rather upset to see outsiders arrive, and the other other is trying to reason with him and get him to calm down, but before the conversation can get very far, an alarm is raised. The docks are under attack. So we go man something vaguely analogous to a rampart and fight off a collection of all new critters that don't seem to exist in the commonwealth emerging from the thick fog. The assignment itself is just shooting gallery type work, so nothing overly exciting, but it does show it that this DLC is going to get wild. You return to the people arguing. Captain Avery, the mayor of Far Harbor, is continuing to try and talk some sense into Alan Lee.
Lee, the town's weapons merchant who was fed up with sitting on the docks waiting to fall prey to the island's wildlife. The island is home to a radioactive madness-inducing fog, which used to only be a problem in certain locations but in recent times has expanded to envelop the entire island. Far Harbor remains one of only two remaining refuges free of the fog, thanks to a series of vapor condensers that surround the settlement courtesy of the synths at Acadia. Lee is a comically short-tempered hothead who desperately attempts to scapegoat anyone in sight for his current circumstances. He blames the Children of Adam, the notorious cult that worships radiation who have a sizable commune on the island for somehow making the fog worse. Avery defends them, assuming that Lee's just an idiot looking to satisfy his own bloodlust, probably correctly. Lee also has a bone to pick with Acadia because they won't give Far Harbor enough fog condensers to take the entire island back. An understandable frustration, but this belief is also based entirely on the assumption that Acadia actually has the resources to produce condensers on such a massive scale, something that here in the post-apocalypse is highly unlikely. Eventually, Lee relents and goes back to Mana's storefront, but has made pretty clear that his behavior will have to be addressed eventually. In the meantime, Avery confirms that Kasumi did in fact pass through Far Harbor and went up to find Acadia. She doesn't have a whole lot more information and warns that the people of Far Harbor are very self-sufficient, stubborn, and don't trust outsiders, so if the sole survivor wants more info, they'll have to gain the people's trust somehow. As we ask around town, we find a couple people who aren't afraid to ask for the mainlander's help and even manage to find a guide, Old Longfellow, willing to take us to Acadia. Sure, he's a crotchety old drunk, but the sole survivors dealt with far worse before. Together, we find our way through the fog, dealing with trappers, pretty much just generic raiders, wolves, mirelurks, even run into a child of Adam who accuses the synths in Acadia of blasphemy because they invented technology that subverts Adam's will by protecting people from the fog. Okay, Alan Lee might actually be onto something with his hatred of the children of Adam here. Finally, they reach Acadia, an old observatory built on a mountaintop above the fog line. Inside, they come face to face with Dima, a, let's call him a highly modified Gen 2 synth. Fully sentient, though many aftermarket vacuum tubes and cables he has protruding from his body are somewhat off-putting and serve as a pretty clear sign that his current level of functionality probably wasn't available when he rolled off the Institute's assembly lines. Dima describes himself as a prototype synth, a stepping stone to bridge the gap between between the old Gen 2 synth and the more advanced Gen 3 synths that dominate people's fears in the present day. Dima was a prototype designed to test what would happen if you let a machine gain sentience and develop personality naturally. His many modifications were added after he escaped from the Institute to combat storage capacity limitations which required him to frequently delete or offload his memories. He's even using many of the old mainframes and terminals lying around Acadia to increase his computational abilities and transfer data back and forth, which is actually pretty cool, and pretty much takes an old synth that shouldn't have more computing power than your average Soltron and cobbles together a Zax computer that your mom ordered for you off Wish.com. Wait, that's a dated reference. What's the current equivalent? I'm a bit of a shut-in. Timu? Whatever, moving on. Dima tells you that Acadia isn't a threat to anyone, and the synths here just want to live their lives in peace, and to that end, they are sheltering Kasumi Nakano as a synth and helping her learn the truth for herself. He says you're free to talk to her, but also poses a few questions to the sole survivor that is meant to throw you a red herring, but instead has sparked one of the more ridiculous mainstream fan theories in all of Fallout that the sole survivor is actually a synth because they don't remember anything from before the day the bombs dropped. No offense if you're one of the people that believes this fan theory, it's just obviously meant to make you chase your own tail and offer just the tiniest sliver of doubt that Kasumi is actually a human. I'll just go ahead and save some additional thoughts I have on this topic here and move on for now. Kasumi can be found tinkering with some machinery in Acadia's depths, and if you ask her to come back to the Commonwealth, she refuses, not just because she's convinced she's a synth, but also because she's found some worrying information about Dima and some of the data he's been building in the Acadia mainframe. Yeah, we weren't buying the soft-spoken pacifist routine anyway. So now we're stuck trying to ingratiate ourselves to the good folks of Acadia while trying to learn anything we can about Dima. When Kasumi's concerns are verified, Dima is confronted with his actions. He says he was simply running simulations to determine the likely death count if war erupted between Far Harbor and the Children of Adam. He's trying desperately to keep the peace between these two factions and needed as much data as possible to help him make informed decisions on how to approach each group. Dang it, that actually sounds plausible. Although Dima is certain he once had the answers to ensuring peace, those memories are now missing, archived to an external server from before his sweet Dropbox subscription here in Acadia. Problem is, that server is buried deep in the submarine base that the Children of Adam are now calling home, so we get to infiltrate, or piously convert, to the Children of Adam to go look for it. Once again, were sent on a number of different quests for various members of our new family, including another cameo by
by Tuvok. I guess that explains why Captain Kells is the go-to for Brotherhood atrocities tied to this DLC. Anyway, we finally get access to the bowels of the base, get to the end, and... No. Don't you do it. No! It's an augmented reality puzzle level. Thank you, Bethesda. You know by 2016, everyone else had already beat this idea into the ground, right? Ugh, fine. We have to navigate through a series of puzzles to unlock Dima's memories, and it seems that he had plenty of reason to leave these locked away because they include a kill switch for the experimental wind farm that provides power to Far Harbor's fog condenser network, the nuclear launch codes for the missiles rusted in place in the nucleus, that's what the children of Adam call their base by now, and a record of Dima murdering one of Far Harbor's residents and replacing them with a synth infiltrator, basically violating every belief that Dima has espoused and would give people like Alan Lee plenty of reason to organize a synth hunt. All of these memories, if they fell into the wrong hands, could spell certain doom for one or more of the island's factions. So we go hunting for the answers and get our hands on the codes, we identify the identity of Far Harbor's infiltra- okay, it's Avery, the one person with the most clout and one voice of reason in all of Far Harbor. Yeah, that wasn't much of a surprise, actually. So we confront Dima and we have a choice. We can either pay the way for Far Harbor's destruction by disabling their condensers, we can convince the Children of Adam to seek division by detonating their own nukes, basically committing mass suicide if that innuendo was too cryptic for you, or you and Dima can scheme together and finally bring peace to the island by murdering the hardline leader of the Children of Adam, Confessor Tectus, and replacing him with another synth infiltrator who is intended to offer a more moderate voice to the Children, the same way Avery does for Far Harbor. Naturally, if you don't feel like doing anyone's bidding or you feel sort of dirty by doing exactly the sort of thing that would make Father Sean's son proud, you can simply choose to keep the Doom Code secret and convince Dima to present himself to Far Harbor for judgment. He can march into the middle of town, admit that he murdered one of their own, and beg that only he be judged for his actions, so Acadia can continue to prosper on their own. Naturally, the hothead Alan Lee will try to use this as justification to whip the town into a frenzied mob to storm Acadia. Depending on the mainlander's actions, the people of Far Harbor, whom he helped along the way, will come forward one by one to speak against Lee, and if we did all the open world stuffs to do in Far Harbor, we can actually get a peaceful end for everyone but Dima. He dies. Sort of fitting. It's by far the most interesting ending, with the greatest sense of accomplishment as one by one people who we've helped return the favor by coming to our aid when the chips are down. It's the most heartfelt and emotional ending, but also the least satisfying with the least chance of assuring long-term peace on the island. The final act is an amazing series of trade-offs, and it's one of the best of not just any brand storyline in a DLC, but in an RPG, period. You can choose to support either of the extremes. Far Harbor's libertarian ideals mesh pretty strongly with Minutemen ideology. The Children of Adam adhere to strict doctrine and ideological hegemony not so dissimilar from Maxon's Brotherhood. Totally different ideology, mind you, but culturally they share a lot of similarities. The ending with best long-term prospect for peace is also the one that requires manipulation, deceit, murder, compromising every ideal that Acadia stands for, but also doing so with the purest of intentions. Or there's doing the right thing that stands the greatest chance of hurting innocence, and even if only the guilty party is judged and punished, they were still someone that was acting with good intentions, and his actions actually did serve to stave off bloodshed, if only for a short while. The only game whose branching stories come even close is Fallout New Vegas, but if we're being honest, that one gets a lot of extra points just because it has the benefit of being a fully fleshed out game rather than a 10 to 15 hour DLC. Anyway, before the angry New Vegas totalitarians show up to my doorstep with a freshly tied noose. Let's go, Morgan! <laughs> there is one last thing for us to do to tie a bow on this case. Oh yeah, that's right, the case. We gotta get Kasumi to go home. We can talk to her one last time, and it's clear she's still confused about who or what she is. The sole survivor can use this as an opportunity to nudge her any direction we want. We can tell her she already knows what she is, we can flat out tell her she's a synth, or we can flat out tell her she's a human. Dealer's choice. But she returns home, and if she claims she's a synth, Kenji will naturally be very upset, but the sole survivor can calm him down, or failing that, this happy little home will be shattered forever as Kenji tosses Kasumi out. If she's human, it's every bit the heartfelt reunion you could possibly hope for. And that's Far Harbor. This is a story-rich DLC. This synopsis completely blew past old Longfellow's companion story arc, most of the faction-specific quests, the funniest twist I think I experienced on any quest in a Fallout game when we go hunt a sea monster called the Red Death. There's just so much to get into, but this video would be massive if I don't cut a bunch of this 
stuff out. But a part I really want to draw attention to is the fact that Dima is most likely wrong about you being a synth. I've heard it all, all the fan fiction, all the theories about the soul survivor being a synth, about how he can use vats without a pit boy because he's a synth. That's called technical oversight, sort of like vats not becoming available as soon as you receive your pit boy in Fallout 3. There's a specific set of conditions that need to be met, and Bethesda just put it in the wrong place in Fallout 4. Deal with it. That entire theory is based on Dima trying to convince you that you're a synth because you don't remember anything from before the bombs dropped, because the writers never tried to create that much backstory for your character. It's a red herring, a snipe hunt, a wild goose chase. Why are all the idioms about misdirection animal related? It's to distract you from the fact that Kasumi is not actually a synth, another human whom Dima has convinced was a synth. I could argue this point for quite some time, but again, I need to move on, so I'll summarize the evidence against Kasumi's synthhood. She doesn't have a synth component, there's no reason the Institute would have replaced her with an infiltrator as the Nakanos are an insignificant family of hermits who live on the very edge of the Commonwealth. Institute infiltrators are fully aware of their own identities, see Roger Warwick, Mayor McDonough, and Art. The Nakanos have known Kasumi her entire life, so she's not a railroad escapee with a mind wipe, and neither the railroad or Institute have any knowledge of Kasumi's actual identity. If Dima is this wrong about Kasumi based on what sounds like somewhat compelling evidence with her nightmares and memory lapses of her own, how likely is the fact that he's wrong about the sole survivor with even less knowledge into their background and less evidence to back up his claims? Alright, let's stop beating around the bush. Storyline, it's pretty incredible. There's a reason it sparked all these fan theories and debate in the Fallout community that is still being discussed ad nauseum almost a decade later. It's just that damn good. Gotta give it a 5 out of 5. Hey folks, if my voice sounds a bit off, it's because I came down with some crazy mole rat disease after recording the rest of this video. Now normally this would be the part of the video where I would ask you to do mean things to the like button, yada yada, but today I just wanted to give a shout out to a fan, Brandon Bryant. Brandon took the time to craft a logo for Grey Gaming to replace that aging one that I made when I was first learning to add text to my videos. Unfortunately, I had just invested in hiring a professional graphic designer, so even though I won't be using your logo, Brandon, I did just want to say thank you and I appreciate the time and energy that you spent on this. It means so much that you would go out of your way to design something like this for me, and I did want to sincerely offer my gratitude. The Far Harbor DLC adds one location in the Commonwealth, the Nakano Residence, and an entirely new map, a somewhat decent representation of Mount Desert Island in Maine. I actually went there earlier this summer, and irony of irony, I couldn't see Jack because of the fog that covered most of the island that day. I blame the children of Adam, but sadly, I have no proof. I almost didn't make it out. You know what they say, people go mad in the fog. Anyway, the island has a lot of fairly interesting things to look at, so long as you're interested in lore. The Vim Pop Factory is pretty big and expansive, but if you're not interested in reading all the terminals and seeing the shady stuff Nuka-Cola was doing before the word of Forza Hostile Takeover, you probably just found it to be another generic factory infested with super mutants. The MS Azalea is also expansive, but also just another sprawling shantytown occupied by the Trappers, who are once again just generic raiders. There is a new vault added in the DLC, which is actually pretty interesting. All of its dwellers are robo-brains, there's a murder mystery that we have to solve, and the believably ridiculous vault tech experience experiment never happened thanks to the overseer funneling funds away from half the vault, so construction only happened on the quote-unquote good half. It's filled with easter eggs and it's all around just a good time, unless you count the requirement that you have to traverse a ghoul-infested multi-level maze of a hotel ruin in order to reach it, and then accidentally steal a phone that was marked as owned that caused the whole vault to aggro and forcing you to go through the hotel a second time. That was a frustrating recording session. There wasn't much that was unique about the vault in terms of new assets, it was just a new combination of things we had seen in other vaults. In particular, Vault 88 contributed a lot to the design here. The Nucleus and Acadia are both very unique, and while the docks of Far Harbor could pretty easily be replicated by one of the more skilled settlement builders out there like Schooled Zone, it still carried with it that waterfront charm that the real world Bar Harbor is known for. Without the fact that all parking in the entire town is metered, Bar Harbor Board of Tourism, I hope you're listening, 
that just felt very greedy. Anyway, Far Harbor. It's one of the few cases where there is actual visible improvement, improvement by Bethesda era Fallout standards, that occurs as a result of your actions, which is a nice touch. The map is larger than Nuka World, but also feels pretty sparse, like there isn't a whole lot here. Now, I know this is not actually the case. There's more marked locations in Far Harbor than there was in Nuka World, and that's even with Bethesda marking several of the park's rides as locations in Nuka World. Maybe it's just the fog adding to a sense of isolation, but I do agree that it feels spacious, empty, and isolated. Maybe that's where all of the comments in my Nuka World video were coming from when they claim that this DLC is boring and bland. I think a lot of this just comes down to environmental factors more so than design. In terms of explorable area, I'm going to give it 4 out of 5, mostly due to that sense of isolation, which I'm pretty sure is intentional, and in that sense I think the DLC definitely succeeded, but I don't think it worked in their favor in this case. As with my Nuka World video, I acknowledge up front that this is a somewhat subjective category, and what works for one person's play of style won't necessarily work for another, but trying to be as objective as possible- Okay, screw it, it's my review and I do what I want! Far Harbor actually doesn't bring huge amounts of new objects to the table. What it does bring are pretty good. The Marine Assault Armor is bar none the best armor in the game, even if it is a bit ugly and has some character clipping issues. The Wetsuit is also a nice alternative to the Vault Suit if you're wanting something a bit more muted in color, but still still like the form-fitted underclothing appearance of the vault suit. I'm pretty partial to December's Child, a unique combat rifle that uses 5.56 ammo, so basically it's the assault rifle without the ugly of being a Fallout 4 assault rifle. For melee builds, there's Adam's Judgment, a super sledge augmented with 4 damage fusion cores. For people that like the broadsider but don't like how hard cannonballs are to locate, there's the harpoon gun. For people that like rifle builds, there's the lever action rifle, which is great unless you have Nuka World installed, in which case it gets completely eclipsed by the handmade rifle. If you're looking for completely outlandish clothing, there's the various outfits and helmets you can get through the Children of Adam or the Trapper armor sets. But the single greatest expansion in objects I have to say is the introduction of the barn build set in the workshop. The barn build set has lots of options for floors, walls, and roofs that aren't full of drafty, drippy, droopy, or otherwise deficient holes, gaps, and other stupidly lazy design choices. It was really this DLC that finally made the vanilla settlement building even remotely tenable in my opinion. Yes, I love my concrete, but you can only build a gray box so many times before you begin to crave a bit of pigment. There's not a lot that's new, and some of what it did well was overshadowed by Nuka World just a few months later, but I think giving it a 3 out of 5 is perfectly fair in this case. Much like the Nuka World video, I feel like I've already given away the punchline here throughout the video by now. Far Harbor's expansion to the settlement building system finally added enough variety that nerds like me could start wasting entire weekends building strongholds across the Commonwealth. There are loads of new critters, fog crawlers, anglers, gulpers, hermit crabs. Even where the enemies are just reskins, they're pretty gnarly reskins that are unique enough that you don't really consider wolves or blood rage mirelurks to be just a minor texture pack and color palette away from the pests you've been stomping all over the Commonwealth. Well. The wildlife here is exactly what you would expect in a Fallout world that takes place on an island off the northern Atlantic coastline, and most have new behaviors that you have to learn to cope with if you want to survive out in the fog. Unlike Nuka World, Vault Tech Workshop, and Automatron that all only added a single workshop location, Far Harbor adds four new settlement locations, each unique, bringing their own challenges, advantages, and requiring different methods of unlocking that are more than simple clean sweep radiant quests. They also added a number of new events to break the monotony of simple getting another settlement attack notification. There's actually coordinated assaults that don't take place from the normal attacker spawn points. There's the condenser down event where the condensers can malfunction allowing the island's wildlife to begin pouring into the settlement from all directions. And there's just a good old fashioned hermit crab hunt where settlers will grab their rifles and head off to get a nice seafood din din. But with that said, there is one mechanic you have to deal with if you want to finish the main storyline and it's that completely unnecessary virtual reality mission. It seems that no matter who you were in the early 2010s, if you were producing a AAA title, you were expected to throw in a VR puzzle mission. Assassin's Creed Revelations had those Desmond platforming missions, Mass Effect 3 had the Geth server mission, and apparently by the end of 2015, Bethesda still felt like this was a thing and they didn't want to be left behind, even though Bethesda always seems to be a few years behind everyone else anyway. Probably a self-fulfilling prophecy there, huh Todd? Anyway, apparently ignorant of the fact that these mission types are usually considered to be some of the least fun out of 
of whatever game they're inserted into, Bethesda decided to throw players into a cyberpunk Minecraft platformer puzzle mission and require you to complete no fewer than three levels, five if you want to unlock added backstory into Nick Valentine's history, and then get completely disappointed when the most convoluted, time-consuming final puzzle just unlocks a multi-item fetch quest for items you can already buy. <sighs> Bethesda, are you listening? I hate you guys so much right now. But since I brought up Nick Valentine, the story as I told it when I offered my synopsis was actually pretty devoid of any references to him despite the fact that the quest begins with a case opened by the Valentine Detective Agency. The reason for this is that you don't need Nick at any point to progress the storyline. He's not essential in any way. You can go to the island alone or with any other companion, although they'll have pretty much nothing to say about the events the mainlander kicks off. But if you choose to bring Nick, you can actually learned that he and Dima were the only two prototypes built by the Institute to bridge the gap between Gen 2 and Gen 3 synths. Dima considers them to be brothers, and it was Dima who masterminded their escape from the Institute together. If you get rid of Nick's noir detective accent, they actually even have the same voice. But Nick was built to test whether a human personality could be imprinted onto a machine, which is why he has the memories of a 250-year-old detective, and after their escape, the confused Nick attacked Dima, forcing them to part ways, and leading to Nick's solitary existence following the escape. Nick's presence during many of the most important conversations with Dima and the Nakanos opens up completely different dialogue options that you otherwise would never get. There is also different dialogue with Dima depending on whether the Institute has been destroyed or is still intact and which factions you've sided with. While none of them are very satisfying, there are options to inform on the synth at Acadia, leading the Railroad to offer their assistance or the Brotherhood to send an assault team to wipe the synths out or the Institute to send SRB teams to reclaim the synths. All of these add to the replayability, allowing players to try different things on multiple playthroughs and get what feels like dozens of different outcomes, even if there are really only five major branches in the ending. And it's a huge part of why this DLC gets such high marks from fans. This level of integration back with the main game that doesn't actually break any storytelling, any headcanon, or otherwise literal gameplay aspects shows that Bethesda actually is capable of well-planned, executed, and integrated story storytelling under the right conditions. Far Harbor doesn't bring a lot of new mechanics to the table, and what it did we probably would have rather done without, but what it managed to accomplish with what was already in place in Fallout 4 has to earn it 4 out of 5 for gameplay at the minum and numinum. <laughs> So to recap, Far Harbor receives a perfect 5 point score for story, 4 points for explorable area, 3 points for new object usefulness, and 4 points for expansion to gameplay mechanics. Resulting in a grace is a good score of 16 out of 20. It sounds pretty harsh considering how much praise I've heaped on the DLC this entire time, but there are valid criticisms that can be leveled against it. It's not perfect, nothing in Fallout is. Not even New Vegas! Bethesda nailed it when they set out to create a region that makes you feel isolated, on edge, vulnerable, but this isn't a survival horror game, and much like the Dead Money DLC from Fallout New Vegas, it creates such an air of foreboding that it can be difficult to push yourself forward at times, at least if you're the sort of person that doesn't like survival horror games. But in terms of story, Fallout doesn't get much better than Far Harbor, and Fallout 4 certainly has nothing else that even comes close to the level of complexity and behavioral realism or provides the same sense of lasting consequence. Throughout the Fallout 4 main storyline, Diamond City, Bunker Hill, the Castle, the Pridwin, the Institute, none of these show any sign of change, evolution, or improvement due to your actions. They can be replaced by a smoking crater if you choose to blow them up, but the Minutemen never restore the walls of the castle. Bunker Hill always remains a pile of rotting lumber. Diamond City is still just a rusting old baseball field surrounded by piles of rubble. In Far Harbor, your actions can allow the locals to add palisades, giant metal plates cut from an old ship hull, even Mirelurk carapaces to fend off acid attacks from Mirelurk queens to increase the defensibility of the docks from attack. When new locations are added to settlements, they're surrounded by fog condensers, a sure sign that change is happening across the island instead of NPCs just being inserted where they weren't before. None of this requires you to do the building yourself or any work in the workshop whatsoever. It's not just good when compared to the rest of Fallout 4, it's just good. I highly recommend you check out Far Harbor if you haven't already and invite you to voice your observations whether they're positive or negative. Let's face it, if they're negative, you probably already posted them before I even finished the intro. But regardless, let it be known that you have opinions too, and at the end of the day, all of our opinions matter. Until next time, stay safe, and I hope to see you here later at Grey Gaming.